welcome to this section of the website. And in this video, um, I'm sure that you want to be able to maximize your patient results with regenerative medicine. So we have an expert to talk to us about doing that and talking about the topic that would not maximize those results, and that is chronic systemic inflammation. So uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Brad Watts. Dr. Brad has a background in strength and conditioning. He has a CSCS, and he also has his certified functional medicine practitioner degree. He is an expert in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. He has participated in over 25,000 nutritional cases in the past 10 years. Brad, welcome. Wow, thank you, doctor. Glad to be here. Yeah, so let's talk about this because I know that um, systemic inflammation can interfere with your ability to uh, have healing process take place, and it can actually interfere with your own stem cells. And even if you have foreign stem cells in your body, which uh, could be from a human cellular tissue product that was injected, you want those to work as opposed to not work, and there's ways to turn them on and turn them off. So why don't you explain to our audience and to me what that is all about? Absolutely. So in the world of regen therapy, we're obviously looking at human cell and tissue product and then the stem cells that your body's actually creating on its own. And uh, you need inflammation in order for those to work. Inflammation is like the, the thing that cracks open the seed when you plant it in the ground. Okay. Right. And, and you need inflammation. The problem is, is when you have too much inflammation, it also shuts those things off. Uh, like everybody loves a fire, but nobody loves a camp, like a house fire, right? You only like campfires. Right. And that's the same idea. We want to have a campfire in our body. We don't want to have a house fire. And unfortunately, in the United States today, most of the patients you're going to be seeing walk into a regen therapy clinic, the house is on fire. Right. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting um, analogy you use because the analogy I used to use is fire in your engine is desired, fire in your house is not. <laughs> and uh, fire in your furnace is desired, fire in your house is not. And it's containing that energy release uh, that is important for your body to function correctly. So you have uh, my attention, I'm sure you have all the listeners' attention who are watching this video. So why don't you uh, jump into it and explain to us what you mean by all that? Absolutely. Well, let's, let's start here uh, if we can. And so one of the things you're going to find out about me is most of the stuff that I say is going to have an absolute uh, easy to find reference on the slide itself. All right. So um, I'll make sure you guys have this PDF as well if you need it. So anyway, um, when we look at inflammation and regenerative interventions, one of the things that we know for certain is that your patients cannot be on anti-inflammatories when they get the injection, okay? And this is super important, and everybody knows this, but most people don't know why. It's because you need inflammation in order for those, uh, those cells, those new cells that are being introduced into the body, those human cell and tissue product, you need inflammation for that to work. And unfortunately, anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, et cetera, they will are, are just like dumping water on that fire. And so we end up in a situation where uh, just, this is the earliest one I could find here, 2007, where we have a, a research citation that says, NSAIDs are found to suppress proliferation and induce cell death in cultured osteoblasts. So they're really talking about human cell and tissue product. And steroids were found to decrease the osteogenesis potential, meaning your body cannot replicate cells when there's no inflammation. You can't do it. Here, six years later, you have another statement by researchers that says aspirin-like drugs could improve the success of stem cell tr transplants. Those two, con those two statements are absolutely contradictory. Right. And so the problem is, is that most providers aren't aware of more than one type of inflammation. And I want to get into that today because if we can control one type of inflammation and allow your patient's body to like chill out, they're going to be more receptive to that human cell and tissue product intervention. Uh, whereas if they're staying on these medications that just bulldoze inflammation altogether, inflammation's a teeter-totter. You want one side to be elevated and one side to compensate when that happens. If we can have balance, things are really cool. If we can't so, have balance, your patients get destroyed and you put $1,500 worth of product into their knee and it doesn't help. Right. So, so what you're actually talking about then is, you know, here's two different studies, and I understand the logic behind both. Mm -hmm. um, but 
what's not taken into account with these two different studies is there's more than one type of inflammation. That's and right. if you have the correct type of inflammation, that opens up the cells enough to allow the bigger cells like stem cells to get in there and do its work. But if you have chronic um, inflammation, well, what that would be like is um, a major traffic jam that is so packed with uh, things in the street that you can't even get the stem cells in there. That's right. That's right. Got it. Okay. Well, then we need to learn a little bit more about inflammation if we're going to be in this business. So go to it. Absolutely. So let's start off by talking about the two types of inflammation, if that's all right. Yep. And, uh, and so we're going to start pretty simply here. There's this thing called NF-kappa beta. And it's a signaling molecule that every cell in your body that has a nucleus contains NF-kappa beta, right? It's uh, essentially like a match that lights a candle. So think of a cell having a match, and if that match is struck, the cell gets lit on fire, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have this nuclear signaling molecule, and what it does is it has a rapid release, or it has a rapid response to injury or infection. It's an indication of tissue damage. So like if you're out playing basketball, Doc, and you sprain your ankle, it's a localized swelling that takes place, okay? Your ankle swells up, your head doesn't swell up. Right. Let me ask a question that might be silly. Sure. But we hear a lot about cytokines and its involvement in this process. Is NF kappa beta a cytokine? It's not, but it is the thing that will uh, basically set those cytokines into, into motion. Totally understand it now. You're, Thank you. You're actually one slide ahead of me. <laughs> okay. All right. So, got it. So, what happens is if you sprain your ankle playing basketball, it's a localized response. Okay. Right. Your head doesn't swell up. Your hands don't swell up. You don't end up in a position. Uh, we have systemic inf one problem. Okay. Same yep. thing happens. Infection. You've seen, I'm sure in the region situation, hundreds of patients that have cellulitis because they have terrible blood flow and all the stuff associated with it. Correct? Yes. Yeah. And what we look at there is when somebody has cellulitis, it's usually localized as well. NF kappa beta is supposed to be a local situation. That's the important part of this process. Okay. Got it. When we look at NF kappa beta and what it actually causes to take place, though, is it stimulates the expression of these pro inflammatory genes in your genetic code, right? And that basically turns on cytokine production. And ultimately, that's what leads to joint tissue destruction. If I sprain my ankle, and this uh, cytokine cascade is able to flourish in that localized reaction, what does it do? It gets in there and it cleans up all of the debris. It takes care of the cells that are vacuums them up, moves them on out, and inflammation calms down after a few days. That's a healthy process. That's what we're looking for. Yes. Make sense? Yep. All right. So just like dominoes, if NF-kappa beta gets triggered, okay, it's going to start to spread from cell to cell. One cell gets inflamed and it tells the next door cell, hey, you should get irritated with me, All right? That's, it's kind of like neighbors. So what we want to do is we want to look at this, this first type of inflammation as like an overuse situation, right? A traumatic overuse situation. This patient right here is your dream patient in a regen setting. This guy, he comes in and he's 80, 80 years old and he's a marathon runner and he's like, man, I've been putting on the miles. Just wore out the cushions. Let's get this action moving in the right direction. You help them. They get better. You never hear from them again. They do all of their relatives, right? And, right? and this is your prototypical patient. If you could like dream of it, this is who you want. The overuse situation. He's had lost trauma, localized inflammation for years, and is now looking for your services. Okay, so get this guy. This is who you want. You want this grandpa, the marathon runner, in your office. Right. He responds very well to treatment. The second type of inflammation that we're going to talk about here is a different way of activating NF-kappa beta, not from a sprained ankle, not from putting the miles on when it comes to running marathons and stuff like that. We're talking about LPS, lipopolysaccharides. Now, lipopolysaccharides are made by the gram-negative bacteria in your gut, okay? So normally they're made by every human being on the planet, lipopolysaccharides. They're supposed to stay in your gut, but because we have interesting uh, lifestyles in the United States, if we can say it that way, with food, 
what happens is, is lipopolysaccharides cross through the gut barrier into the bloodstream and they create a, an, a reaction called uh, an endotoxin reaction. That's basically an infection from something your body produced, okay? And LPS activates these NF-kappa beta molecules and, uh, and basically lights the body on fire. The problem is, is that LPS gets into the bloodstream. Okay? LPS gets into the bloodstream and it goes all the places. It goes everywhere. And when it goes everywhere, it's lighting NF-kappa beta on fire everywhere. Absolutely so, everywhere. So LPS, the, the saccharide tells me it's a sugar, which means that this is something that people are putting in their mouth. So what happens is, is people eat trashy food like McDonald's or KFC or whatever, and they do that for year after year after year. They eat sugar, uh, they're drinking Coke and all this stuff. And what happens is, is the bacteria in their gut start to produce a super version of LPS. Really? Uh, yeah, it's crazy. And it crosses from the gut barrier into the bloodstream. And that bloodstream obviously is a willing medium to disseminate information. And that's all chemicals are, it's just information. Well, this LPS is taken everywhere. And all of a sudden, people are eating and drinking food and their cognitive function is starting to decline. Right, their joints are starting to hurt. They have a whole bunch of diffuse muscle pain issues. Go to the doctor. The doctor's putting them on, you know, Flexerol and all these different muscle relaxants, pain medication. And then all of a sudden, we're Ohio, and uh, and we're loaded up on opioids, wondering where everybody's supposed to go after they pass away. Okay. Right. Right. And, and this is what's happening in the U.S. right now. It's wild. So let me, let me get this straight. So the the the, the bacteria in your gut, which Everybody should know this. I'm pretty sure they do, but a lot of people don't. Um, you have a tremendous amount of viruses and bacteria that live in your body that are supposed to be there. And That's the right. correct way to look at your body is not as an entity that you are, but actually a colony that you control. Would that be accurate? That's right. And and I would even hesitate to say control. <laughs> so, well, okay. That, yeah. Well, if you don't take care of it, it starts to control you 100%. because those bacteria have certain cravings. And sometimes that craving for sugar you have might not be you. It might be the bacteria. And you That's feed right. them and they start to make these lipopolysaccharides. Is that accurate? That's right. Amazing. Amazing. It is. It's, it's pretty stunning uh, to see how people change when they start regulating some of the things I'm going to tell you about today is pretty stunning. Okay. So anyway, the toll-like receptor is a thing on a, outside of the cell that lipopolysaccharides uh, trigger. It's like a light switch. That toll-like receptor flips the switch on and that tells NF kappa beta time to get upset. And, um, and so this happens in the absence of injury or infection, which is really interesting to think about because if we're supposed to be in a position where NF kappa beta is reserved use for like injury or infection, okay? Here we have an endotoxin reaction, something my body created triggering the inflammatory response, right? And, and it's going systemic. So here's the slide for all of you people that are watching this that have to have like some physiology pictures in your brain. And you can see here at the top it says LPS activates toll-like receptors, triggers the release of, uh, from the macrophage, excuse me. And here we are, this is a cell, let me just make find this here. There you go, here's your cell membrane. And here is the receptor on the outside and it's triggering an F-kappa beta in the middle here, which will then trip the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascades. And just like a domino, once this trigger has been pushed, the rest of the dominoes are gonna fall over and you're stuck with a cell that's now inflamed and telling its neighbors they should also get inflamed. All right. Now, lipopolysaccharides, just for a, a brief moment here. This is my world, right? I'm a, a medicine provider, and I get to educate providers all over the country regarding functional medicine, and this is the world that we're living in. 50% of the U.S. population has full-blown metabolic endotoxemia. What that means is, is they have out-of-control LPS. Diabetes, cognitive decline, autoimmune conditions, joint destruction, fibromyalgia, you name it. These people, okay? So it is amazing. So LPS created by gram-negative bacteria in the gut, as I said, 
right? And then the endotoxemia from non-genetic causes or non-injury related causes, which means that it's the L word is lifestyle. Lifestyle is a word that modern medicine has been pushing away because they have nothing for it. They have nothing for it, right? And we're in a unique position in healthcare as natural healthcare providers, as providers that are looking at regen services, for crying out loud. We're in a unique position. We're at our, our like unique selling proposition to the marketplace is, I hope I help you so much that you don't have to be my patient anymore. And medicine doesn't say that. Medicine, without sick people, medicine doesn't exist. Right. So it's amazing. Right. So anyway, this lifestyle situation, we're going to talk about that a little bit more intently here because as I briefly mentioned, McDonald's and KFC and even, I'd sad to say, your local grocery store for the most part has been pouring gas on a fire. And, and so commensal bacteria, normal bacteria in your gut, they're stacked um, with, they're inundated, I should say, with saturated fatty acids from our diet. And saturated fatty acids, remember, are the ones that don't have hydrogen uh, all maximized around that molecule. So well, we, then, get these, we get these products like hydrogenated oils, right, right. that your french fries are, are fried in. Is that part of the lipo part of this? Like the lipopolysaccharides, lipos, fat, saccharides are sugar. So right. it's the fats, the bad fats that you're getting in your diet that contribute to this? Absolutely. So as well as the sugar. Right, right. So if we're taking in a bunch of like uh, just saturated fat and or trans fat, that type of thing as well, and we start allowing this gut bacteria, it's just a manufacturing facility, okay? The gut bacteria is a manufacturing facility. When that takes place, it starts producing a super version of LPS that is highly toxic, and now it's no longer the match, right? It's not like a match lighting NF kappa beta on fire anymore. This is a picture of Elon Musk's, uh, the Tesla guy, his flamethrower, right? That's what this is right here, is by eating too many saturated fats for a period of time, your patients are lighting their body on fire with a blowtorch. And it is, it is something that unfortunately, um, I mean, 80, 90% of the population is consistently doing. I would say less than 5% of the population even knows what LPS is and even smaller amount of the population knows how to control it. And so we're going to talk about that today because this is the difference between your regen patients getting and your re regen patient you 16 times saying, I thought I was supposed to feel better by now. Right. Right. And, and that's to say, I, I, even with the setup, right. That, that uh, AMI is currently working with, the results are like off the charts, off the charts. And so this is just taking it to that next level, that next tier. Well, I gotta tell you, it's yeah. that patient who comes in and says, you know, this isn't working, that we tend to focus on. Right. And if you're gonna be a clinician who's really excellent at your game, um, you would pay attention to this. Now, even though it's working on the other patients, I'd be willing to say, since the vast majority of them are unaware of this and do fall into this category that they're not getting the full potential benefit. That's right. That's yeah. right. Wait, wait till you see what happens here. Right. Cause this is, remember this dude right here, the 80 year old marathon runner, he's the one you want in your practice. Right. But he rarely shows up. This is the guy that shows up. It says man eats 30,000 Big Mac. Okay. And, uh, and here you have a picture of this guy. The question is, is does he look healthy? Right. He doesn't look healthy. He's, he doesn't look overweight, but he doesn't look healthy. Okay? No, and, he, 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 right, needs hair. <laughs> he looks happy, <laughs> right? right? He looks happy, but he's not healthy. The guy that's walking into your practice, his physiology's on fire, right? but he can't tell you that because he doesn't know. And right. most providers will look at this guy and they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this gentleman and this gentleman. Right? Because it's like a, a secret language their body is trying to tell you about. And it's lipopolysaccharides uh, to the max. So you've heard of advanced aging? Yeah. Yeah. Guess what induces advanced aging? Cell death. Guess what induces cell death? And if kappa, oh, okay, right. kappa beta is getting flipped on by lipopolysaccharides. So, so the whole thing together. 
Right. So, all right. So you got these two different guys now. You got the 80-year-old marathon runner, and you got this gentleman who's taken down 30,000 Big Macs. And we have uh, a picture here. I have little kids, so I saw this picture, and I thought this was a, a very good way of describing what's happening here, okay? So we have a teeter-totter, right? The problem is, is that everybody that shows up in a regen clinic thinks it's their old football injury. as to, That's why they're there, okay? They think it's because, well, when I was 26, I went on a hike out in the mountains in Rocky Mountain National Park, and my knees have never been the same since. Right? They're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Most of your patients are in the office. Most of your patients are there because of the chemical nature of repeated assault over and over and over. This is reality for them. Their chemical burdens are driving them to your clinic. And even the person who had the football injury, that mm -hmm. it, all the evidence looks like it is from that injury because the one he has it, the other the one doesn't, is probably feeling it more because of this inflammation. That's right. The question is, is if it was from your football injury, how could you have your knee replaced like, you know, 30 years ago? And an over cartilage wearing down and wearing down. And if it's compared to the left side, let's say left is perfect and beautiful. The right side is a mess. That injury is, remember, flipped on NF Kappa Beta, and then they kept that slow burn happening with their diet over time. So it's like stoking the fire. Which is why they usually draw health as a triangle, mental, structural, chemical. One That's feeds right. into the other. A hundred percent. So okay. what's, what's beautiful, though, is that we're talking about NF Kappa Beta and we're talking about LPS and all this stuff. Uh, there's got to be a way around it. Otherwise, I wouldn't just present a problem and be like, all right, see ya. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. uh, these are some of the goals that you have to have in a regenerative support environment. And, and the goals have to be realistic, okay? Like you're not going to take your 80-year-old marathon runner and be like, all right, let's get to that sub four-hour marathon once again that he did when he was 30, right? But what we are talking about is quality of life and activity and the availability of going to the grocery store if they want to go to the grocery store, that type of thing. Like real life scenarios, spending time with the grandkids, getting on the floor and rolling around with them rather than just sitting in the chair because you can't move, okay? And so what we want to do is we want to be able to create a local environment where this therapy that you're introducing, the human cell and tissue product and their own stem cells that are endemic to their body, we want to make sure that this has uh, an, an environment that will foster progress rather than an environment that's just suppressing their ability to proliferate. That's number one. It has to be it. Number two, you have to be able to decrease LPS. If production, then for crying out loud, you have to be able to decrease their act on the rest of physiology. Okay, so some people won't ever put the KFC down, but we still have to be have a way to serve them that allows them to maximize their uh, human cell and tissue product intervention. Absolutely. Got Number it. three, you gotta support healthy tissue genesis. And uh, so this means collagen, you gotta work with the collagen uh, forces that your body already has in it. One of the things I like to talk about, uh, especially in person with all the docs sitting in front of you is ask you, with human cell and tissue product, is there a new meniscus growing in that tube no, there's not. There's potential in that tube, okay? There's potential. Is there a new synovial fluid in that tube? No, there's potential in that tube. What it takes is introducing those, those, uh, those human cell and tissue product potential, right? Introducing it into something that has electricity, you, right? right. Introducing that. And that electricity causes those instructions that are inside of that product to begin to unfold and create new tissue. And that's really what we're talking about with this collagen synthesis. We've got to be able to enhance that. Osteogenic activity, obviously. Synovial fluid is a key factor in this. And um, so I'm going to show you what the main lipid component of synovial fluid is here in a moment. And then making sure that membrane health is um, left with some integrity because ultimately you don't want these new tissues to be broken down just as fast as they showed up. Right. So, so what you're talking about then is if you're doing regenerative medicine and the, the human cellular tissue product is the seed, 
that seed is going to thrive depending upon the soil that it goes in. And this that's isn't right. like, I mean, this is a concept that's been around for ages. I think it was Antoine Bichamp who called it terrain theory. If you've ever heard of that guy. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the terrain is your body. So mm-hmm. you cultivate that soil by what you put in your body. And right. um, if you inject something like a uh, potential of an HCTP into your body, it's still got to have that basic material to work with, that basic soil to grow in. And um, that explains why when we were talking to one of the lead scientists at um, Predicted, uh, his name was Doug Schmidt, brilliant guy, and he was asked a question by one of the doctors in the audience. What is the most important factor for the human cellular tissue product to work? Why would it work in some patients, not in the other? And he thought for a minute, and then he answered this way. He said, it's the food they've been putting in their mouth for the previous three months. That's right. It's and it's a novel idea, right? Yeah, actually, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing that our bodies will withstand thirty or forty years of eating trashy food. It's amazing, right? It's amazing. So it, it, one of the one of the things that uh, to take that seed or terrain theory a little bit farther is one of the things that's important is that inside of that human cell and tissue product vial, there's not vitamin C, there's not collagen, right? You're not talking about having synovial fluid in those vials. What's in that vial is an instructional manual. What's in that vial are the blueprints that your body now is going to have to go and use. Your genetic code uses that and will start to express the instructions now, what's interesting is you got to have building blocks for that. One right. of the studies that I like to often cite, uh, and it's coming up here in a little bit, but I'll just lay it out now, is that cursor to almost all joint destruction in the human body is subclinical vitamin C insufficiencies. That's the wow. bar none. That is the precursor. Okay, Your body uses C for many other things that over time, your skeletal structure and all of the associated tissues uh, surrounding it, connective tissue, et cetera, the, it gets starved of the thing it needs in order to maintain its integrity. And it's, it's amazing to see. So you know, when I was those, in school, go ahead. Uh, uh, j- if I could just interrupt here. Yeah. When I was in school, one of my classmates, it's Dr. Scott that you, we talked about. Um, yeah. His uh, grandfather, I think was a researcher in biochemistry and, um, he, he, his, his, I remember Scott telling me in school that his grandfather was a, the biggest proponent of vitamin C back in the 60s when he was growing up. You need vitamin C. You need vitamin C. You can't be healthy without vitamin C. And these reasons, you know, it didn't really dawn on me until like the COVID-19 occurred in right. uh, 2020. That, and people were, in China, they were actually saving people by super high doses of vitamin C. That's right. And, um, the delivery mechanism is totally important in that because if you're taking it orally, you your body starts rejected at 1,500 milligrams. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. But if you take it like liposomally, you can absorb a lot more. And that's how they were actually either that or through IV, mm-hmm. which wasn't you know as convenient as liposomal. But you could get a higher quantity in there. And that was stopping the cytokine cascade, that's which right. makes perfect sense with what you're saying right now. That's right. So speaking of delivery mechanism, this is what we're looking at right here. These are liposomal versions of vitamin C and phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine is the thing that makes up the liposome. And we're going to lay out how this works to uh, come alongside and support the star of your practice, your human cell product. We want to talk about nutrition will actually allow those things to fresh in your bodies and and so when you look at vitamin c the biggest thing favorite part about it is that it's an antioxidant and antioxidants like a buzzword in healthcare but nobody knows that actually does and i want to show you that because it's a a, an electron donor okay it's an antioxidant so here doc humor me for a minute Uh, do you remember these pictures of mitochondria like back i do and you your history here. <laughs> the powerhouse of the cell. That's right. Powerhouse of the cell. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, this is a healthy mitochondria. Look how smooth the membrane is, right? And yep. you breathe in oxygen, 
you eat food, your body mashes the oxygen and glucose together and it gives you ATP. And that's what this is right here, this green supply of ATP energy. Okay. It also, as you exhale, you're also getting some free radicals. And these are just uh, free radical, basically oxidative stress is what we look at. So if we have an antioxidant, what is it battling? Oxidative stress, which is this stuff here. Okay. And over time, and the standard American diet, your patients move from this nice smooth mitochondria into this dilapidated, disgusting looking thing. And, um, and basically what you're looking at is their ATP supply being smaller, their output smaller, but their reactive oxygen species or their free radical damage is massive. We basically have a flip-flop uh, from ATP to ROS here, now ROS to ATP. It's flip-flop. This is aging in a nutshell. This is diabetes in a nutshell. This is many autoimmune conditions in a nutshell. This is tissue destruction. Uh, this is destroying your meniscus in a nutshell. Right here. So that, is then that is why free radical damage accelerates the aging process. Not That's only right. is, it, is it damaging your tissue and causing it to shrivel up and making you wrinkled, because just like the mitochondria, your skin gets wrinkled. That's right. And your, your ATP is being decreased, so therefore your energy is decreased. That's right. So as, as uh, these reactive oxygen species start to build up and pile up within the cell, what do you think that does to the cell? It flips on that NF kappa beta, causes the cytokine response, and ultimately cell death. This is how yeah. tissue gets destroyed in the knee, in the hip, in the ang, in the shoulders. This is how skin gets wrinkly, right? Like I was here, and my little dude just turned one last month. Doesn't. <laughs> So, well, let's not point out each other's wrinkles because yeah. we'll be on for a while. <laughs> so, but this is what's happening though in process. Okay, now if process is happening in your joint for a thirty-year period, there's got to be a way to turn that down. And so, when we look at vitamin C as an antioxidant, it's basically a vacuum that gets into the cell and sucks up all of those reactive oxygen species. It sucks up all of that um, antioxidant or excuse me, all of that oxidative stress, and it works as an antioxidant specifically in that manner. Now, we put it in a reduced form. It's unoxidized so that when it gets in there, all it wants to do is just start grabbing things, right? It just grabs all of that oxidative stress, all of that reactive oxygen species. I keep saying the different terms because depending on your background, whether you're a nurse or an MD or an ND or whatever it is you do, you're going to have heard them in different ways. So it's metabolic dust what I call it, metabolic dust right here. Okay, this stuff is metabolic dust. And just like nobody wants to live in a house or an apartment that's been, not been dusted for 30 years, nobody wants to have a body that's got 30 years of metabolic dust building up in it. And, uh, and that's unfortunately uh, where it happens. Here's that study I was telling you about with vitamin C. So musculoskeletal manifestations of scurvy Interesting, non-injury related joint destruction beginning as a subclinical scurvy. It's a crazy thing. Interesting, so like I know from history, when they first started sailing across the ocean and that trip took a couple months, mm -hmm. they didn't have a way to refrigerate food, so they were finding out that they were getting diseases, one of them being scurvy, and one of the symptoms of that disease is not only breakdown of your skin, but breakdown of your joints. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, and then uh, scurvy all but eradicated for a hundred years in, in the United States and Europe because uh, the governments were mandating that foods be fortified with vitamin C. Like, remember when you're a kid eating cereal and it'll be like fortified with vitamin C. We don't, we don't get that anymore. And most people look at vitamin C and they're like, well, oranges. Okay. How many oranges do you eat a day? How many are you supposed to eat a day? <laughs> like right. you start thinking about it. Well, we don't have that fortification process the same way. It's not mandated uh, the way that it was in the past. And so there's been an onslaught of this subclinical scurvy situation. It's making a comeback in 2020. So it's yeah, well, just another thing. Yeah, well, unfortunately, at a very high price. But yeah, <laughs> it is making a comeback. That's right. That's right. So here's a study um, that looking at regeneration of static load uh, in degenerated articular cartilage. So what they did is they basically had um, these, these patients that they would look at injecting new articular cartilage into their knees. And then they told them, all right, 
go out for a walk, all right, go for a run, like you'd never tell your patient that, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, that's like planting a seed and then going and tilling the garden again, wondering how come it didn't work? Right. And, uh, and so it's the same thing here. So this vitamin C supplementation of chondrocytes after static loading has the potential to reduce the biochemical degeneration of that chondrocyte. What they're saying is, is that vitamin C prevented the, uh, the static loading from destroying that new chondrocyte activity, right? So using vitamin C, allowing your patients uh, a little bit more of a defense against destroying their own human cell and tissue product intervention. So very cool. I like that. Um, here, vitamin C absorption rates. This is something that you mentioned, doctor, um, just briefly. But when we look at absorption of vitamin C in a capsule-based format or a powder-based format, you're looking at less than 50% absorption rates, less than 50%. And that's because your, your gut has an off switch at about 1,500 milligrams uh, on the high end and 1,100 for some individuals on the low end. But that off switch will lead to diarrhea, meaning once you introduce more than enough vitamin C, according to your gut, uh, it will induce a flushing mechanism and your patient will end up in the bathroom. But we don't and like that, that. The important state is according to your gut. That's right. Because that's just one environment. The rest of your body can take a different level. Right. That's right. right. And so now you're, this is the same gut that's producing that super version of LPS. This is the same that's gut right. that goes to KFC every day. This is the same gut that's walking into your practice. And, you know, you're wondering, is this going to be the patient that gets better or not? <laughs> so this is the same gut. So what happens is, is if we take vitamin C and we move it into a lipid absorption model, something like a liposome, which I'll show you a picture of here momentarily, what happens is the absorption rate skyrocket, right? We're like rivaling IV therapy when it comes to uh, absorption rates. Okay, 80 to 90%. But even more importantly is the cellular uptake. So in an IV, 100% of what goes through that tube, through the needle, into the arm, right, is going to end up in the bloodstream, 100%. Right. So that's 100% absorption. Right. It does not mean that that 100% absorption translates into cellular uptake. Right. Get the, the difference get past there? the gatekeeper of the cell. That's right using liposomal technology like biogenetics has here, what we're allowing your body to do is to take up these liposomes at 80, 90% clip. And then because it's in a liposome, the cellular uptake is massive. So there's studies that are showing corollaries with glutathione and some of the other products that we use where it's a hundred times the cellular uptake over IV therapy. Got it. So the, the, that's, that's incredible. And the delivery is actually easier. I mean, you put it in your mouth and you don't swallow it right away. You hold it in your mouth to have it, the, the liposomal allows it to transfer across the membranes into the bloodstream. And then That's it right. still retains some of that liposomal quality where it can actually cross the same barriers to get into the cells that need it. 100%. And this is what it looks like once again. They're liquids that are basically fat that has been specifically mixed into nanoparticles, they're called. So they're very tiny, which is why you can still see through the liquid here as you kind of look at the vitamin C. You can see through that. It means the particles are small enough to actually be absorbed without requiring your stomach or your intestines to do any of the absorption. Right. They don't need to be digested. So they start absorbing the moment they come into contact, which is why a lot of people use them for their skin and stuff like that as well. So. All right, fan favorite, uh, helpful tip there. <laughs> Those there wrinkles go. we talked about. <laughs> so, right, right on the wrinkles. That's right, that's right. So the lipid model of absorption decreases, uh, this is straight out of the medical literature, okay? Decrease inflammatory arthritis because of the lipo mo lipid model of absorption, okay? Prevent, uh, preventing osteoarthritis, we like that. Improved collagen formation, I love that. That's not even in the presence of human cell and tissue product. That's in the presence of your own stem cells. Imagine now what that looks like as you're introducing a large quantity of human cell and tissue product to a patient that hasn't had any regeneration in years. <laughs> right. Incredible. Incredible. So, um, again, we're going to vacuum up that metabolic dust, right? And ideal levels of inflammation. Once again, you need inflammation, but the inflammation you need is endemic 
to the human cell and tissue product. The human cell and tissue product causes the inflammation that you want. We don't want the body to be inflamed before the introduction of that human cell and tissue product. Okay, makes sense, doctor? Yes, it does. Okay, that's vitamin C wrapped in phosphatidylcholine. Okay, phosphatidylcholine is the blue and yellow layer around the nutrient there. Phosphatidylcholine, so, go ahead. I was going to ask you about phosphatidylcholine. I wrote that down as a question because you have the Biomax PC. Mm -hmm. Is that working in conjunction with the vitamin C or how does. how does that work? It does. So it's actually phosphatidylcholine is the main lipid component of synovial fluid. It's what makes synovial fluid slippery. Got it. Okay. okay. Without phosphatidylcholine, what happens is, is your joints begin to degenerate because the cell membranes don't have enough of its own product to replicate itself. So let's say this is what a cell membrane is supposed to look like. And over time, the holes showing up in this cell membrane. And, and what's happening is, is we start to have an inability to repair those gaps in the cell membrane. That's where tissue destruction really takes place. And in order for a cell membrane, which is phosphatidylcholine, to regenerate, it has to have building block. If you don't have building block, there's nothing to build the house with. So anyway, very interesting. Uh, phosphatidylcholine, yeah. go ahead. I said it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I just throw this out here because a lot of times, uh, well, let me ask you this, doctor. How long does it take for human cell and tissue product to, to take root in the body and really start well, to it, develop? It varies, but what real, to really have the regenerative growth, it's similar to like fixing a broken bone. It could take three months. That's right. That's right. And so when you look at 90 to 120 days, which is what the conservative literature talks about, how come your patients are getting better? They're feeling better before then. That's one of the questions. Well, the patients that are using the biogenetics regen kit, it's because phosphatidylcholine itself is allowing those damaged tissues, those cell membranes to rehab. And so here's a study from 2009 that talks about oral phosphatidylcholine by itself, alleviating the signs of rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Uh, it says here, experimental rheumatoid arthritis. Can you imagine signing up for that? No. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, anyway, phosphatidylcholine has been shown to increase secretory IgA levels in the gut. And this is the link. This is the one. If you're going to remember anything from this presentation, it got to be this. That's the thing that combats lipopolysaccharide endotoxemia. Destroys it. Got it. So okay. the, the cut down on the... Not only do you want to put the vitamin C in to control the dust and, and to all the different things you just explained and even generated collagen, the poly um, or phosphatidylcholine is essential to actually stop the fuel going into those um, bacteria causing the lipopolysaccharide. That's right. It tells that bacterial factory to chill the heck out. And and it doesn't just limit it to that. It's also the essential ingredient in you making more synovial fluid and even membranes. That's right. So this is like, I, I didn't realize this about the polysaccharide. It's one of the most, or the phos not the polysaccharide, I'm confusing my P's and C's. <laughs> phosphatidylcholine. Yeah. Phosphatidylcholine is as um, integral to this program as the C is. Absolutely. And so much so that we wrapped the vitamin C in the phosphatidylcholine. <laughs> Got it. So, so these two different layers of inflammation that we talked about previously, remember your patients all think it's the old injury. That's why they're there. Right. It's not, it's the chemical nature of their lifestyle. That's why they're there. So, so the we, chemical nature of their lifestyle and how it handled that old injury. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Got it. So when we look, when you see somebody walking in with extremely wrinkly skin and their joints are destroyed and they're a walker or worse, I want you to think about this picture, right? The mitochondria are getting destroyed and right. you're seeing that in their skin. The skin is, is it's, it's amazing to me how closely you can look at somebody and then look at their laboratory chemistries and stuff like that. And they mimic exactly what they look like. It's just, it's stunning. It's stunning. So anyway, lipopolysaccharides and uh, liposomes, right, to confuse our terms there. But when we look at lipopolysaccharides destroying physiology, liposomes are the key. 
liposomes. You can take thousands and thousands of dollars worth of supplementation and not even make a dent in these patients' degenerative conditions, right? Because you're missing the liposomal technology. And so what I wanted to do is just highlight in this liposomal technology that we have here with the Biogenetics Regen Support Kit, we're talking about sizes now of these uh, liposomes. So over here, just to give you a brief overview, these are called multi-lamellar vesicles. So you can see they have multiple layers, right? Right. In the middle, you have large unilamellar vesicles. So we have one layer, but it's large. Yep. And then on the, on the far side, we have small unilamellar vesicles. Now, these are scaled based off of uh, nanometers. And so when we look at multi-lamellar vesicles, just to give you a picture here, this is like a Volkswagen, okay? Yep. The size of a Volkswagen over here. If we look next one down, large unilamellar vesicles, this is like a beach ball, okay? And if we come down here to the small unilamellar vesicle, this is like a BB. So we go from a Volkswagen to a BB, and the important part to remember is, is that if you're going to spend attention on your patients with nutrition, you want to give them small liposomes, the smallest that you can get and still remain stable. That's where biogenetics comes into play and why I love working with biogenetics is because we have proprietary technology, right, where the scientists that are behind this have created a stable liposome that is shelf stable, will sit in a freezer for multiple years without degrading, okay, and it's a product that you can see through, meaning the, the uh, liposome size is this small unilamellar vesicle. They're so tiny that light passes between the particles. Whereas any other liposome you're going to find in the marketplace right now, you can't see through it. It looks like toothpaste. That stuff requires actual digestion because it's, once again, a Volkswagen when compared to the BB. Got it. So anyway, I wanted to throw that out there. Here's a, a citation for anybody that wants to look for the lubricant, actual uh, lubrication of articular cartilage there with phosphatidylcholine. So okay. anyway, to give you a quick summary, Dr of why we use nutrition with human cell and tissue product patients, it's because those blueprints, the human cell and tissue product, is not grow into the tissue itself. It doesn't get consumed as part of the reactions and rebuilding. Cell and tissue product and your own stem cells are like a field marshal. They just say, hey, we need more of this over here, less of this over here, and could you guys keep it down a little, okay? That's what human cell and tissue product is doing. It's not being um, it's not being consumed in the reaction itself, if that makes sense. So giving yes. the body building blocks to be able to go and do what it's designed to do, it's it's amazing. It is so rewarding to be able to see these patients getting a result that lasts because they've been building it from the ground up for the 90 days that you've been working with them. So just anyway, I just get so excited about it. Yeah, and you should because you know uh, you're talking about different subjects here, and some of them you're experts on. You're an expert on, and some of them when you're talking about human cellular tissue products, I'm an expert on, and I've heard a right. lot of speakers, and I can tell that your analogy of these HCTPs is right up there with the leading scientists that I've heard speak, which is some pretty big ones. Um, so your, I can tell your data is right on the cutting edge. So this is amazing. It's fascinating. Yeah, well, happy to help. So um, what I'd like to do is if you have any questions specifically, Doc, that uh, you'd like to talk about, we can do that. And um, well, the main thing that we covered was um, how you can support these. Uh, so, yeah, the, the question I want to ask you is you, you have a program for a regenerative support kit. The, the products you have there is the Biomax PC and the BioG Max C. That's right. Are they the only products in that kit? They're the only products in that kit. This kit will last approximately 30 days. Right. And, um, and so most providers that participate with biogenetics get two kits per injection for their patient, and they build them right into the cost of programming. Right. So you'd be really smart um, if you were going to try to plant some seeds in your patient's body to regenerate a joint that you put something in to help that soil to be able to do the job it's supposed to do. Um, 100%. That's what this would be. But ideally, this would be something you should do ongoing for through life. And it's something that I started doing back when the COVID-19 first hit through your 
advice and, and we interviewed you for that. And um, I've been doing it and I'm going to continue to do it knowing that what it did for me then and what it's doing for me now, um, this is something I want to continue through life. And that would be the smart thing. That's right. That's right. And this is uh, just a doorway, a gateway into the entire world of biogenetics. And, um, and so different offerings, et cetera, for patients that are in different parts of their life cycle. And, uh, and I'd love to, to be able to talk to you guys about that at some point as well. It's a real okay. passion. So but this um, is a great doorway. Good. So we will have uh, in this video um, a link for you to be able to get to um, order this kit. If you want to use this for your patients, I highly recommend it. That's why we're putting it on our website. Very rarely do we put another vendor's product on our website, but we did this one because we feel so strongly about it and we know it's going to do the most to help your patients get the results that they're looking for and that you want to get them to have. So understanding that it's been valuable. Thanks for being part of this, Brad. Absolutely. Your uh, AMI uh, people can certainly email Zeb, Z-E-B, at biogenetics.com. Zeb at biogenetics.com. He'll take care of everything AMI for you, all right? Perfect. Thank you.